I said, empty your mind. Be formless, shapeless, like water. It's about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. Join movement expert Aaron Alexander as he dives into the minds of the foremost innovative healthcare thinkers and movement masters on their approach to optimal health and wellness. Online Podcast. Welcome back to Line Podcast. My name is Aaron Alexander. Today's tremendous episode, I got to have my friend Dr. Mercola back on the show. Dr. Joseph Mercola, that is. Um, Dr. Mercola is a multiple time New York Times bestselling author. Uh, his most recent book, Fat for Fuel, and then as well, uh, he co authored a book called Super Fuel. Um, both of those guys get into the value of the ketogenic diet and the value of fats in our lives, obviously. Um, Dr. Mercola is, he's tremendous. He is an absolute pioneer in the world of, I guess you call it alternative medicine. I don't really love that term, uh, but he's been tremendous voice in all things outside of the box thinking around medicine. So really greatly appreciate his existence in the world and great appreciate his uh, time here on the Align podcast. Um, thank you so much for tuning in to the website, alignpodcast.com, A-L-I-G-N podcast.com. On there, you can start the five-day movement challenge. Breaks down five simple videos on how to integrate better movement into your life. Uh, I want to thank you guys for leaving reviews on iTunes and telling your friends, sharing this. Uh, if this is of value to you, I challenge you to help us out here in the online podcast world and tell a couple of your friends about it. Really appreciate it. Um, I think we're good to go. This conversation gets into, I mean, you're going to find out, so I don't need to tell you, but about value of sun and vitamin D and cold thermogenesis and a lot of really powerful stuff. So hope you guys dig it. Really greatly appreciate the people that have purchased the Align Method online program that can be found at alignpodcast.com slash align method, or you can find it on the Align Podcast Instagram page in the bio. Uh, that guy gets into how to unwind the patterns of staring into technology. So forward head posture, roll forward shoulders, hunchy spine, disengaged glutes, all that stuff that happens to us from sitting on our ass in chairs, staring at the cell phone. So check that out. Um, also includes like movement flows and stuff like that. All right. I hope you love this conversation. I hope you are enjoying your day. And uh, here we go. Back to the show. Dr. McCola. Pow. Align Podcast. I, I read an article on your, your website and it was blown my mind about getting out like around noon and high sun and all that stuff. Can we talk about that a little bit? Sure. Okay. The, first of all, the book, the best book out there that summarizes this quite eloquently is called Embracing the Sun. Embracing the Sun, just spelled just like it sounds, written by Mark Sorensen. Okay. And uh, it was just published earlier this year. I'm going to be interviewing Mark in a few months. Uh, really is all, all the main... Uh, illuminaries and vitamin D researcher in the book. So it's solid science. Uh, and it's and I'm going to summarize what the book says in this interview. But if you want more details, I'll go with that book. We also have a lot of information on the site. I've been promoting vitamin D for almost probably close to 20 years, well before it was accepted in conventional medicine. This is an actually, I, I helped catalyze the interest in vitamin D as a uh, a really important therapeutic tool because prior to that it was just understood to be useful for rickets which is baloney it's that, that it certainly is useful for rickets but that's a minor component of what it does because it's a radically uh useful to to decrease significantly by over 50 percent the incidence of cancer hmm. and heart disease I mean, if we had a drug that cut the risk of heart disease by 50%, the risk of cancer by 50%, I mean, it, it, that's a trillion dollar drug. And this thing does it, it's li literally the least expensive supplement on the market. I mean, the vitamin D, it doesn't come much less expensive than vitamin D. But here's the, here's the rub. The vitamin D that you swallow is not the best way to optimize your vitamin D levels. Why? Because it's the you need to get it from ideally you get it from the sun which you and i can both do you live in california i live in florida which is one of the reasons why i moved to florida i so first of all what are the therapeutic levels of vitamin d so that we know what the target is to achieve all the benefits we're going to discuss um vitamin d should be it's a, called the the 25 hydroxy d and it should be between 60 and 80 nanograms per milliliter if you're in the u.s and multiply that two by 2.5 if you're, then it's nanomoles per liter if you're in Canada or in Europe. Uh, 
So same, same level, just different units. So once you reach that level, all the wonderful things happen, such as the reduction of the cancers and the heart disease. So the, this is in direct conflict. So I think you should get it from the sun. And I haven't swallowed vitamin D in over 10 years, yet my level the, when I took it last week was 70. Hmm. Um, 70 nanograms with no vitamin D. Now, admittedly, it's towards the end of the summer, but you know, I, I go out at solar noon. So at this time of the year, certainly fall, all of winter and spring, if you're at a relatively low latitude, uh, below 30 degrees, or I think it might even be 35 like, like I am, then you, if you go out at solar noon, you get the maximum amount of UVB. Or if you live at altitude, that's the other exception, because you could be in like Colorado or Utah, 7, 10, 12,000 feet, and uh, there's less atmosphere up there. So that atmosphere acts as a screen for ultraviolet B so that you get a lot more ultraviolet B coming through. And you could actually get significant vitamin D at higher latitudes if you're at altitude, which you, you know normally couldn't do if you were at sea level. So, um, what are the benefits of using the sun as opposed to swallowing a pill? Which is why you should target yourself for, you know, getting sun exposure, sensible sun exposure. Never get burnt. That's the key. So, if you're very light skinned and Irish, and it might be five minutes that you're in the sun, but if you're an African American, it might be five hours. You know, depending on the time of year. So, um, and that's skin in the sun. It doesn't count if you're walking from your house to your car to go to work and you've got a long sleeve shirt on and long sleeve pants, you're not going to get virtually any vitamin D. On your hands and your face, it just doesn't count. I mean, it's insignificant, clinically insignificant. So what are the benefits of exposing significant amount of skin is that you're not, the, I talk about UVB because that's the wavelength of the sun that actually causes the 7-deoxycholesterol in your skin to convert to vitamin D and then be absorbed. It's interestingly, transdermal vitamin D is, or through the skin is probably the best way, if you're going to take a supplement to use it rather than swallow it, because that's the way your body uses it anyway. Um, and actually, we're coming up with a sunscreen that has vitamin D in it, a healthy sunscreen, because most of the sunscreens are bad news. Um, but anyway, I'll go into, remind me, if I, I should remember this, but in case I forget, we've got to talk about sunscreen. I'll so the benefits, the benefits of exposing your skin to the sun are multiple. The primary ones are that you not only get the UVB, which makes vitamin D. And interestingly, I've come to the conclusion that vitamin D is a marker. It's a marker for healthy sun exposure. So that if you fake out your body and elevate your vitamin D artificially and not through the sun, you may not achieve all the results that are noted in the epidemiological studies that correlate their healthy vitamin D levels with reduced incidence of cancer, heart disease, and autoimmune diseases. Hmm. So would you fake it? Now, you're still going to probably get some benefit, but you may not get all the benefits. And what are the other benefits? Well, there's UVA, which is a more powerful wavelength, and it tends to not disappear on cloudy days. But UVA on your skin will cause the release of nitric oxide powerful free radical biological signaling molecule it has many benefits like lowering blood pressure and reducing your risk for heart disease. So nitric oxide is one. Then the other one, you probably know this, 40% of the radiation from the sun hitting your skin is near infrared, near infrared, right. which does a lot of great things. I mean, I'm a big, I suspect you're a big proponent of near infrared, so it's not far, but near and the reason why is it actually is like recharging the batteries in your cell and your specifically your mitochondrial electron transport chain, the cytochrome C oxidases. And I think it's in cytochrome two and four, I believe. So uh, it might be, I might have that mixed up, but essentially it knocks off the nitric oxide that near infrared off of the cytochrome C and then it causes it to become more efficient. And essentially you can create more ATP. Hmm. Plus, it's a magnificent way to, to detoxify, you know, so it helps uh, really dr help if you've got any uh, fat-soluble toxins floating around because you've been in cyclical ketosis or for whatever reason, you know, it's going to be a good way to facilitate the excretion of those, especially through your sweat. So uh, that's the primary reason. So, so you, you know, if you're... Uh, uh, re, uh, sort of a uh, new to natural medicine and not 
aware of the details and have studied this, you might say, well, what? you can say that, but all the public health authorities and the, you know, almost every physician, including especially the dermatologist, warn against the sun. Right. They just, they should only swallow vitamin D. They warned it's just too dangerous, going to increase your risk for cancer. Well, that is bunk. That's BOS, not BS. It's BOS. It's bunk on steroids. <laughs> okay. Now to tell you why. First of all, what caused this? I didn't understand the reason for this position until I read the book Embrace the Sun, and I learned that it's ultimately catalyzed by the sunscreen industry. Exactly. <laughs> Imagine that. So they are funding the dermatologists and throwing money their way. And there's some, I forget the numbers. And I, you know, I have, I've, I've read the book. I actually could look it up if, you, if you're interested. But well, you put it in the notes. Yeah, that would be actually. Yeah. So the, I, I, come, let me look my embrace the sun notes. If you go to my, so my I, notes. so I, I did a, um, recently I did a thing with Nadine Artemis. She's like the, uh, do you know her? She's just living libations, all that stuff, essential oil and stuff. Um, yeah, I've heard of her. I think I've, yeah. I've had dinner with yeah, so one of the things that we, we, that we were breaking down is she was talking about getting like sunspots and like the, the issues with um, being exposed to only partial aspects of the sun. So when you're using sunblock, certain sunblocks is only blocking specific rays. Um, and your body knows how to process the sun in its entirety, but when you block out specific UVA or UVB, then all of a sudden it's like it's confusing to the body. Is there something something to that? Yeah, because the vitamin D, the UVB that produces the vitamin D, actually uh, reduces the risk of cancer. So, you know, and here's the, here's the thing. I'm still looking for the number, but I, do I found this interesting stat. Sunscreen sales have increased spectacularly by about 3,000%. 3,000%, which is up 30 times, right? Hmm. So... The onslaught of advertising to produ produ that produces the profits, but what has happened to the risk of melanoma, the cancer rates for melanoma? Melanoma has increased the sunscreen, wait, let me see, is that 3,000? No, no, as sunscreen scales have increased spectacularly, melanoma has increased by about 3,000%. So the use of sunscreen, I have the numbers mixed up, sorry. Uh, um, is not wow. helping at all melanoma. Now it may help, there's three types of skin cancers, melanoma and then basal cell and squamous cell. The melanoma is the one that can metastasize and is very deadly, it's a pretty bad cancer actually. Uh, and that does not appear to be related to sun exposure at all. The, the basal cell and the squamous cell are, and they can kill you, but it's pretty odd because you've got this big honking lesion that you'd have to be kind of demented or irrational not to go to the doctor to figure out. So it does kill some people and any death is a tragedy, but for everyone who dies from one of these cancers, there's probably hundreds, if not thousands of additional people for every single one that are dying from cancer and heart disease because of insufficient sun exposure. Hmm. I mean, the trade-off is just incredible. So what about using zinc oxide? What are your thoughts on using something like, like that? Yes, as uh, Dave Asprey is fond of saying, kind of zinc oxide on your face as a sunscreen is kind of like uh, a, uh, a facial prophylactic because you're going to look so, you're, you're going to be it's very cosmetically unappealing. Oh, yeah, right. But as far as, yeah. but, but it's blocking all. No, it's very effective. No, there's two, t two types of zinc oxide. Sorry about that. Oh, it's okay. Finally, my phone was not been working for all day. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hopefully the podcast had back, some effect yeah, on just, it. The podcast is lucky for phones, actually. It's more notorious for that. Yeah, I'll, turn, I'll, I'll exit this up. I didn't think I needed to exit it because we're in the process of moving our offices. I'm exiting the application. It won't happen again. Sorry. If any listeners okay. have a broken phone, just call in. We can get you in the podcast. We'll get that thing fixed. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, it, it works. It works. <laughs> it works. The podcast works. <laughs> but yeah, so that, yeah. but so that's that's the thing that yeah, I. Find. I only have a landline. That was a landline, actually. I know that sounded old school. So it was. Old school. I do not have a cell phone that I talk on, except when this line was busted. I had to have an hour phone call on my cell phone, which is like the longest call I've had on a cell phone all year. But so uh. it's, it, it seems like blocking, like like isolating one 
aspect of the sun is, is where it gets slippery. It's like expose yourself to the entirety of the sun or just cover up completely. It, it seems like the best advice that I've, I've yeah, heard. There, there are times when you should be on sunscreen, but not a conventional sunscreen, which are exactly. toxic. Oxybenzoate and some other damn. So what are what are what are options that are well, well, toxic and zinc oxide or you don't have to use sunscreen. Okay, you could use shade. You can use a wide brimmed hat and yeah, some exactly. long sleeve shirts and sleeve pants or get or go inside. So right. I mean, you should never get burnt. If you, you know, if you gradually increase your exposure and uh, then get in the shade or afterwards. For whatever reason you can't, then the sunscreen would be appropriate, but it's going to be cosmetically uh, not appealing because it's white. <laughs> it that's how it works. It it it's a nanoparticle that's more cosmetically appealing, but stay away from that because it's toxic. It's not, you know, there, it's not biologically compatible and it's going to cause some problems. Yeah, it acts as birth control, actually, because no one's going to want to sleep with you. That's what it was. It was that, yeah, birth control for your head is what Dave asked me. Birth control, was. yeah. I've never quoted Dave Asprey before. That was the first time on the podcast. That's good. That's a good experience. Yeah. Yeah. So, so zinc oxide, are there any other options that would be relevant? I've, I've used before, like, like coconut oil is being one. We've like mixed no, up. Coconut like, oil is not, it's and not stuff. It's not, it has a lot of benefits. I use about four ounces of coconut oil a day myself. I love it, but it's not a sunscreen. In fact, yeah. it probably would increase the penetration. To no. So we did a thing. It was this coconut oil. It was like zinc oxide, cacao powder, magnesium. It was like yeah, all sorts, all sorts of fun stuff. Not the coconut oil. Coconut oil is a base for the right. other stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then what about exposing, exposing? You don't want to put anything on your skin that you would, wouldn't eat. Exactly. Certainly. Yeah, yeah, I live by that. So another thing that I found like majorly fascinating, which was the original reason of, of reaching out amongst others, was um, the value of actually getting out during high sun, which is contrary yeah, yeah. to every advice that you've ever received your whole entire life. Yes, indeed. Uh, <laughs> it's... it's Shocking, you know, that conventional medicine could be wrong in something so foundationally basic. Yeah. And so what so what is that? We have to question the validity of their approach. If they can miss something so obvious and be so wrong on I me, mean, absolutely polar opposite of the truth, then what about the things that are are a lot more complex right. and there's a, a lot of subtleties to it? You know, I just don't trust them for anything, hardly, except for acute trauma care. So how much, how much high, so you think just like sub, if you feel like you're getting red, you're getting pink, you like, you feel like, oh, I yeah, like, not like, even red, pink, pink. Yeah. So if no, you're I've in got, that territory, then you're, get out. If you're, if you're like of uh, Mediterranean origin or certainly Middle East or African India, then you've got you get dark skin. It's not an issue. You're not, probably never going to get burned, but if you don't, you've got to be careful. A lot yeah. of people need to be careful from Northern European descent. Yeah. Another thing that I've found interesting in specifically in like, well, and anywhere in the world, really, um, instead of using sunblock, I've just eaten a buttload of fat. And I found that it feels like it like, it like hydrates my cells. It becomes protective is the way it feels. Is there, is there something to that? Well, not that I'm aware, but there is oh, one, really? one fat soluble supplement that has been shown to be very effective. And that is called astaxanthin, right. which is a, which is probably the most potent carotenoid known to man um, far exceeds the uh, antioxidant capacity of almost all the other carotenoids put together. So uh, I take about 12, maybe probably close to 20 milligrams a day of astaxanthin cool. for a variety of reasons. I just love it as a, as a nutrient. What are some other reasons? Um, it, well, it's not necessarily as antioxidant capacity, but uh, the ability to participate. It, it, it's an antioxidant that recharges. So most of the once like vitamin C or vitamin E or glutathione, once they donate their electron, they get oxidized and they become useless and sometimes even toxic. Whereas astaxanthin can donate electrons like 20 times or so before it has to be recharged, usually with NADPH. Okay. And then could you talk? Okay, I, got the, I got the latitude. The latitude is hey, 35 degrees. So, and I was, I thought it was 30, but it's 35 degrees. So if you're north of 35, so I'm, I'm like at 27 degrees, I think then you're not going to, anything north of 35 is not going to get UVB in the winter at all. Mm. Unless and you're at altitude. Unless you're so at altitude. Is, it's the UVB that most sunblocks block out, right? No, that's the, that's the rub. They actually block out UVA, or at I least they used UVA. to be. Yeah. What the, the current stats are. And so they would, they would block UVB, which, which increases vitamin D, protects you against cancer, and they would 
let UVA roll all the way one through, you know, so which is the one that causes the cancer. Oh, that's what I mean. They, 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 they block out UVB and it lets UVA pass. Usually, right? but there's probably some now because they've, they've known that for a while. They probably fixed it in a bunch of them, but I'm sure there's a bunch that still happened. Right. And when you're out during the high noon hours, I just want to like wrap my head around this. You're getting, like I think of the sun as kind of, it's, it's almost like you're getting different nutrients throughout the day. You know, so in the morning time, it's like a different plate than it would be in the, in the noon and the evening. And you want to get that whole variety of nutrients. Is there something to that or is that a ridiculous analogy? Well, it's not really new. It's photonutrients. It's different wavelengths of light that are well, more down. It's meta meta metaphoric purposes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, I would call them photonutrients. So, yeah, right. Yeah. So you, I think it really depends on your individual circumstances. But if you're in the winter for most places, even where I'm in, in Florida, I mean, that's when you really want to get out there around solar noon. I say solar noon because in the summer – nearly everyone is in daylight savings time and solar noon is really 1 p.m., not 12. So you gotta be a little bit careful, which makes it a little bit easier to the sun exposure because uh, especially when you're south of 35 degrees latitude, uh, you could overdose it pretty easily. So yeah. you may not wanna go out around solar noon, you may wanna go out earlier, but you know, like 10 a.m. Uh, where you still get some UVB, but you know, not the intense exposure. Right, but you'll get things from the sun during the high hours yeah. that you could never UVA, get during the morning or the, or the evening. Nitric oxide and then the, the near infrared, which are the keys. And there's other right. frequency wavelength that uh, you can get with the blue predominance and then uh, the red at different times. So blue okay. is usually in the early morning. Yeah. Do you have any opinion on, on um, saunas between like, like infrared saunas? Is there like any brands that you think are, are, are the best? Of, yeah. What Most, was that? I have a lot of opinions on saunas. Most yeah, of them are think? fraudulent. Oh, perfect. <laughs> what do you think of sunlight? Uh, fraudulent. Oh, man. Why? Tell me. Tell me everything. What do you, what do you I maybe have to mix up. I think there's sunlight or clear light. One of them. One uh, of them is okay. I forget which one. Okay. But it's still somewhat deceptive. I think, it, I think it's clear light that is the one that has. Well, here's the thing. Any far infrared sauna is not necessarily what it's promoted to be. Okay. What are the promotions? It, it, anyone who tells you they have a full spectrum far infrared sauna is lying. Hmm. Okay, it, it's like it's physically impossible. You can't do it. Secondly, they say it's low EMF. Right. It's which is like it doesn't exist. I've never seen a far infrared sauna that's low EMF. By that I mean there's three. Elect fields of electrical fields. There's electrical, there's magnetic, and there's radio frequency fields. So electrical and magnetic are all very low frequencies. And if anything, the, the ones that are advertised as low EMF are probably low magnetic. That's they, that they probably got right, and you can take your tri-field meter there and get low magnetic fields. But if you have a sophisticated electrical field measurement, usually off the chart. And even if it is low, which is rare, I think there's only one other saw I've seen that is low electrical fields, they, they don't block for radio frequency fields. So which is not, it's not necessarily dangerous because the saw is not producing them. And it's the same radio frequency fields that it's ambiently exposed to in your house. So it's you know right outside the sauna versus inside the sauna is going to be the same. So if you've got your Wi-Fi going and you're near a cell phone tower, you've got your cell phone on, you're still going to have radio frequency fields. But there are saunas that are truly have blocking shields that have block out the radio frequency fields. You say, well, why is this important? Because when you're, you're, you're primarily using a sauna to, to Don, I, I'm sorry about that. I thought I no, exited okay. that. No, it's not okay. I'm going to have to, I, I exited the application. Now I have to exit it from task manager. Darn it. Okay. <laughs> the future oh. technology. It's okay. Here. Now it's done. Now it's done out for sure. It's still state. It was even though it wasn't showing us. Sorry about that, but it's no, just, works. Anyway, so um, where was I? I was saying the uh, saunas, oh. infrared saunas, and, and blocking out various different EMF versus magnetic frequency. Like, I know, I forgot different. the point I was mentioning. I was in a flow. And, well, and so, and all right, well, I have another question. So, infrared saunas, are they, is there anything that you can get from an infrared sauna that you couldn't get from just being out in the sun? Oh, sauna? no, no, I know where I was off. All so, right. the reason why you're doing an infrared sauna is that you're detoxing. This is the point I want to explain. Exactly. So I want to yeah. So 
I mean, you could use it for other reasons, but I would say the vast majority, probably 99% of people are using it for that purpose. Right. So when your, your body really can't optimally detox if it's in sympathetic mode. It's just really, really hard to do. So right. these exposure to these EMF fields put you in sympathetic mode. Where you're in, in a truly EMF-free sauna, then you're in parasympathetic mode. Hmm. Then you can detox more effectively. I was using a far infrared sauna before I have the one I have now, and because it claimed to be low EMF, and it had 65,000 millivolts of electrical fields. 65,000. You should have like maybe 10. Wow. <laughs> less than 20. Jeez. Yeah. So, and that's, that wasn't unusual. That is pretty much more of the standard rather than the exception, the rule rather than the exception. So, so you've got to be careful. So is there some detoxification that can happen from being in a sauna that would be different than just like taking a walk in the park? I mean, you obviously sweat more. Yeah, there, well, you, you, unless it's a really hot and humid walk, which is yeah. unusual. <laughs> Texas, I, I, Austin. Yeah, but you know, if you were like exercising, which would be more likely. So when you're exercising, it's the same principle. You're usually in sympathetic mode, so you're not going to detox effectively. And this has actually been measured. They measure this, the toxins huh. and sweat someone who's exercising and someone in a sauna. It's really radically different. What's the difference? There's more toxins in the sauna. Because so, so because you're in a, a more of a sympathetic state. Wow, yeah. I had no idea. Well, That's, yeah, isn't it amazing? So, I mean, do you know reality the, is it's pretty simple, you know, if you think about it. What is it? The whole concept is simple. <laughs> it's not like rocket science. Well, I'm not very smart, Dr. Bercola. I, I write books about sitting on the floor. <laughs> no, no, okay. Well, some optics are. I mean, I've studied some stuff now that you really need, you know, advanced degrees in biochemistry and understand, but this is basic. <laughs> Uh, when you're in a sympathetic state, you're more uh, inclined to hang on to whatever you have because your body... Well, it's just there are processes that occur in your body, primarily, well, in mo most of your cells, but primarily in your liver, that uh, is, are responsible for processing these toxins from fat. Uh, because they, they're fat soluble, so then they have to be water soluble, and then they have to be conjugated so they can be effectively excreted. So hmm. that's like phase one and two detoxification. Hmm. So, um, and it's difficult to do if you're sympathetically activated. Huh. So, breath work would probably lend itself to. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Breath work and meditation is a good way to activate parasympathetic. Interesting. So would you go into more of a detoxifying state just from being in more of like a, like an alpha brain or alpha theta, like by, well, by you, actually in a relaxed state? You're deep, more detoxification capable. You still have to initiate the pro metabolic processes to cause the water, the toxins to be released from your cells. Because, right. well, most of the toxins are fat soluble, so you're in your cells. So, you know, you can sweat them out with a sauna or you can fast them out. So your body is really burning fat as a fuel. Right. Whole other topic, which we're not talking about today. But when you're in that state of ketosis and you're actually liberating these toxins, then you can stack other things like like uh, bitters, to, which cause you to excrete them, excrete these toxins into the bile. And, you know, there's other support systems like N-acetylcysteine, uh, which helps glutathione, which conjugates these uh, pernicious toxins. Uh, and then you have binders on top of it. So it's a whole big sequence. But I mean, literally, that's a three-hour lecture or so. What do you think of sun gazing and, and like being sure to expose the sun to your eyes, especially in the morning? And then that, that stems into like wearing glasses at all during the day. But kind of two questions. Like sun gazing early in the morning before sun goes sun down? Fine. I mean, there is obviously some danger there if you do it not either at sunrise or sunset because the, the rays are too intense and you can cause retinal damage. Right. So, but I think it's probably, I've, I've never been able to do it consistently. I did try it for a few times. Well, and ideally while you're grounding, but that's a whole other issue. Grounding in North America is probably not a good thing to do. Unless you're on the ocean, you could do it on the ocean. So, I mean, you and I could do that. We are in different oceans. But uh, Hold on, what do you mean grounding in North America is not a good idea to do? Like taking your shoes off isn't a good idea in North America? Well, it's a good idea for other structural reasons, you know, to, to so be what, barefoot. 
I would, from my understanding, I mean, tell me why. I'm not, I'm not in, I'm not yelling in disagreement. I'm just yelling in curiosity. <laughs> yeah, well, and you could do it in Europe or South America, but the problem is, is the substations from the electrical utility industries have decided for financial reasons not to put returns for their grounds back to the substation. So essentially you get these high voltage transients that are embedded in the ground. Now, if you're near a large body of water, like an ocean or a large lake, then those currents really dissipate and you kind of bypass that problem, or if you're in a really, really remote area. So it's not every place in North America, it's just most places where people live. Huh. It's, the ground is contaminated. So it's, that's why I don't ground anymore in North America. Unless I'm, unless I'm on the ocean, you know, I'm walking in the ocean. So you think it would be you're better off wearing insulated soles like you know, rubber shoes than if you if you're uh, anywhere around like like yeah, a developed is, area. Is, right. And this is this is only true since the last, I don't know, 50, 60 years or so. It's an artifact of industrialization of North America. Holy crap. It's a consequence. It's an, it's a consequence of technology intervention. I and mean, if you go to a you know a, a non-developed country, you're not gonna run into this problem. Huh. So, or if they follow the rules correctly as they do in Europe. So, now I could be totally wrong, but I've I've studied with some interesting, you know, respected uh, people in the electrical field, and this is their conclusion. And I, and I don't have any reason that I could dispute them. I tried to, but I really couldn't. So. Well, I've heard that in relation to like grounding sheets and stuff that you could be making things worse by by plugging it into the ground if there is like what you're yeah, describing is nearby. Yeah, but you can even plug into the ground. It's the same darn thing. You know, a lot of people yeah. don't like to do it because of the dirty electricity in the house, but it's the, the dirty electricity is in the ground. So all the ground, and you can actually measure this. I've got expensive equipment that you can prove it to yourself. You know, you know what's interesting like with that? I wonder, I wonder what the core, I wonder. It's so they measure it. Yeah. So one of the things I'm reading about in, in relation to the book stuff is, is um, the, you increase your likelihood like vastly of, of developing schizophrenia by living in a city. If you, if you grow up in a city, it's like so you statistically have a sniff and higher chance of developing schizophrenia throughout your life um, compared to people that are like out in the country. I wonder how much of that is just what you're talking about right now. If it's like an electrical thing. Well, that's part of it for sure. Uh, Abram Hoffer was a psychiatrist, uh, who was really well respected and did a lot of work on niacin or vitamin B3, which mm -hmm. is actually a precursor of NAD. And you know, he used very, very high doses, high doses that you wouldn't need necessarily to replenish NAD. Uh, but he got some pretty darn good results. And they, you know, they may have a genetic polymorphism or a SNP, single nucleotide polymorphism, that has them require more vitamin B3 or niacin. So that that, that book is if you type as in Google, Hoffer, H O F F E R, Abram, and schizophrenia, it'll come right up. It's done a lot of work on that. I think in our last conversation, you mentioned the value of magnesium in ameliorating some of this stuff. Yeah, magnesium is, is like, in fact, I've got this really great uh, experiment I'm doing. It's an expensive one, but it's like $20,000 or so. I'm, but I'm having a float tank created for me that is uh, shielded from radio frequencies. And I've got, it's got a really high-end ozone system, so there's no chlorine in there and everything, and uh, good pump. And uh, I'm just going to use float and magnesium sulfate and see what it does to my magnesium levels. Because it's really hard to increase magnesium, because if you take it orally, it's a laxative, and if you, you know, and then you, you know, it's going to impact your stool quality and your microbiome if you take too much. So, right. but, but only needs magnesium. And I'm looking at float and see if I can increase it. What do you think about floating? So I have, I wanted to show you, I, I meant to give you a tour of my house, but I, I forgot we turned the video up too soon. I have a, a freezer sitting behind me here on my porch and then I have an infrared sauna made by sunlight. No big deal. Um, hopefully. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully you could, I, I never finished the, 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 the sauna because there are, there, the, the only healthy sauna that I know of is by a sauna space, which is truly EMF free, but it's They're pricey. like EMF, right? Yeah, it, it truly is EMF and tested by the most sophisticated meters that I know of, meters that cost thousands of dollars. So truly free EMF, but it's $8,000 for this thing. So a lot of people can't afford that. So Well, that's how much get... mine was. The sunlight is not cheap. It's, I think mine was like, yeah, like not, nine grand yeah, or something like that. Cheapskate, but, you know, no, I'm, you no can... I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it's, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm trying to defend them. I'll defend you, sunlight. 
you can get the innards from the sauna space, which is essentially four heat lamp bulbs, okay? Okay. I, I just don't remember if, it, I think it's, I just don't remember which one it is, but they have these ceramic heaters in the far infrared, and they have one that supposedly submits near infrared, but there's no way it's full spectrum. Right. Because you can see near infrared, some, you know, certainly can see the red. You begin, if it's dark, you can still see frequencies up to like 800, 850 nanometers. You can see this flake go red, and you will not see that on these cer ceramic near infrared panels. And, and even if you did, they only have two small panels on the front, and there's no way they're going to hit your body consistently. Yeah. So, it, far infrared is a totally different animal. It doesn't penetrate as far. It only penetrates a few millimeters, where near infrared will go to like three, three inches. It does heat you. So, you know, and you're sunlight, and you have to preheat it, right? Otherwise, you're going to be cold in there for 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. With, with, uh, with a near infrared, the moment you turn it on, you're hot because it, it goes right into you. It definitely penetrates. You know, and that's one of the things that annoys me is that many of these companies say, oh, yeah, far infrared penetrates your skin. And it doesn't. It only goes a few millimeters. It's, well, that, it happens, buys it. that happens with the sunlight because I'll turn it on. Sometimes I'll leave it off. This isn't a very interesting story. But I, I, don't, I like the timer will go off and I'll go in and be like, oh, it's 120 degrees, but it doesn't feel hot. And then I'll turn it back on. And within seconds, I'm like, oh, God, it's hot in here. So it does... I do get that. You could, you could get in, get in there. Line, but you know, the ones that I've used it took quite a while to warm up. Yeah, I th I'm pretty sure. I mean, I don't know. You got to just come over and we got to, I got to get you in my cold plunge and we got to go do a sauna. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, <laughs> we're cold, yeah, I live in Florida and it's 80 <laughs> and this is, we're recording this um, a week before Thanksgiving. Yeah. And, but tomorrow night it's going down to 44, so I'll have my cold plunge ready. Like what do you think? So, what do you think of the value of cold thermogenesis? And then also oh, yeah. more tandem questions, pairing it with heat. Oh yeah, I think the combination is great. Now, why? Uh, it does two primary things that I'm aware of. One is it increases brown adipose tissue. Yeah. So it basically couples mitochondrial protein, so that you can actually burn fat really effectively and not uh, burn calories and not necessarily generate energy, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, but then. There's an interesting component I read from one of my biochemical researchers that I follow, that the sirtuins, our longevity proteins, are really important for extending longevity. And normally, they require NAD, nicotinamide adenine nucleotide, which is a really important coenzyme, family of coenzymes. But And one of the reasons why sirtuins fail to work is because people are exposed to EMFs and they consume their NAD through another enzyme system called PARP or poly ADP ribose polymerase. So when you have at low NAD levels, sirtuins don't work because they have to, they need fuel just like it, PARP needs it. So when you get low NAD levels, one of the ways around that aside from taking NAD precursors is to do cold thermogenesis. It will actually activate CERT1 without NAD. It was, it's the most amazing thing. It's like it's a redundancy that the body has. Wow. And then the value specifically between going hot to cold, because that's something I find. I, my, my, my grand recipe is I go, I go sauna, then I go cold plunge, and then I get naked and go up onto my roof and sun my, my bits. What do you think of the value? I apologize for the last part if you didn't hear that. <laughs> uh, I think that's useful. Yeah, I, I just, I, I just uh, don't have as much privacy, so I can't do that last part. Uh, but, you know, essentially, I just have everything but small shorts on, so it doesn't really matter. But I usually do my sauna in the morning, so it's a little bit, uh, yeah, you know, the sun exposure is not going to be as good. Right. Exactly. Uh, but, yeah, I, I do like it. I think the sauna, I mean, that's what most of the fins where a lot of the versions is done, decreasing cardiovascular disease, was the, the, you know, they had the cold plunge afterwards, too. Yeah. So it takes a while. Now, you don't have to get ice, I don't know what temperature you keep yours at, but it's Ray Cronice did a lot of good work on this, C-R-O-N-I-S-E. Uh -huh. And he, included, he did a lot of studies. He's, he's one of the few guys that has a metabolic chamber, so he can figure these things out. That you don't, really don't have to get that cold. Like mid-60, 60, 67 or so, maybe 10, 15 minutes is all you need. And oh, really? that is 67. It's cold, but it's tolerable. When you go to low 60s, I don't know, how cold is yours when you go? It's very cold. It's like there's ice on the side. Okay, no, no, no. I think that's too cold. I think it's unnecessarily, <laughs> unnecessarily harsh. I, I like to impress it. my friends. That's like honestly why. Well, you know, that's an ego. Thing. I know. Nice I know. Metabolic fine tuning. All right. So, um, I 
think it's too cold. I mean, I would not personally do that. And I'll tell you, you're, you're relatively young and you're very healthy. Uh, I mean, exercise is another phenomenal way to improve your health. And it does it through some magnificent pathways, uh, pr primarily through PPAR gamma and PGCA1 alpha. Hmm. Uh, but it uh, but does unbelievably beneficial things to your body, increases autophagy, massive improvements for uh, neurodegenerative diseases. But when you're fit like that, you can get away with a lot of shit. But when you get older, you have to be much more careful. And actually some of these extreme stuff, and I know the Wim Hof has been doing it for a long time, he's up there, but I just don't think it's the wisest strategy. I think it's better to be more moderate. And, you know, I mean, yeah, if you wanted, if you, if you had, if you, if you lived in an environment where that was the case and you did have ice and snow on the ground, then maybe that's not unreasonable because that's your environment. You're in there normally, but you're not. Yeah. So yeah. I don't think it's, you know, you're, you're not adapted to that. I don't think it's a wise thing. To do. And it's just unless it's not necessary. You not you can get most of 98% of the benefits with a much, much less pain. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. There's something about the pain that I'm kind of into for some reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. How long are you in there for? Uh, so, well, it depends. Sometimes, so I was actually just Wim, with Wim, like literally probably five days ago or so. And I was, okay. I, I got to pick his brain about. Um, yeah, well, the, Wim's, Wim's obviously prejudiced. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but he gave me this like great recipe before I go to bed. He said, he said about an hour before you go to bed. Um, his opinion, which I didn't think it was going to be, um, is do just like two or three minutes, which I usually go like six or seven minutes, which is, you know, whatever. Um, he said like two minutes is fine. And then he said, take a hot shower after that and do that about an hour before you go to bed. And he said, like, you'll sleep the best ever. Do you, do you think there's anything to that? Is that just some like whim whimism? Yeah, I, I haven't played with it, but I think there may be something to it. Yeah, two minutes. Is, two minutes is reasonable. I mean, because, you, you know, when you're shivering, you go hypothermic and you shiver, I, I just don't think that's the healthiest thing. It's, it, aside from being so terribly uncomfortable. Yeah. You know, I mean, when you're shivering for like an hour, it's just like, oh. Right. So one of the, so we were supposed to talk about sun, not we're supposed to talk about anything, but as far as like the book stuff, that was the big thing I was curious. What about wearing sun glasses during the day? Like when people take their glasses off and their eyes are all scrunched up and it looks, it's just like what? Yeah, well, I, I walk on the beach virtually most every day and now there's less people there because it's getting colder, it's about, you know, close to it's fall coming up, approaching winter, uh, Christmas. Yeah. But, uh, you know, when there's more people out there, I would say 50% of people walking the beach or, or more are wearing sunglasses and wearing shoes. Right, exactly. It's just and wearing a shirt. You know, it's crazy. like, what the? You know, it's just so crazy. Yeah, you know, the people do not get it. You should not be wearing sunglasses. Now, aside from, you know, one of the ways that I get in the shade, because I don't use any sunblock, I just use a hat, a baseball cap. Right. And, you know, and that puts my face in shade because you don't really need to get excess sun on your the, the skin on your face because that's more susceptible to photo aging. So you want to preserve that. You could even put, you could even justify using the safe sunscreen on that to, to you know de to decrease wrinkling. Sure. Um, but things like astaxanthin and other nutrients for your skin, uh, bone broth, which is a healthy bone broth, not a from China, uh, will um, provide the raw materials like the glycine and the proline, hydroxyproline to rebuild the structure of your skin cell so right and prevent fine wrinkling yeah cool um yeah i mean I, I think so much of our health information just comes from advertisers like we don't realize oh it. yeah <laughs> like, yeah that's when you look people look around people are well, selling glasses and and selling the, the ultimate advertisers are the drug companies who advertise to doctors through subsidies of their educational programs so that they are marketed to and essentially manipulate and deceive and believe this is true when it's just all the ultimate reality is just marketing hype. Right. And they're telling it to their patients as gospel medical truth when all it is is what you said, marketing. Yeah. Um, what else are people missing about the sun? Is there any standout points that we've been lied to for the last 40 years? And that's so take well, your freaking sunglasses off. Probably 400,000 people every year die prematurely, unnecessarily as a result of not enough sun exposure. That's all. 400,000. Yeah. Wow. Well. Almost half a million people. Wow. Now, interestingly, too, you know, the, the sufficient levels of vitamin D. Come on, I'm so Damn sorry. Damn phone. I'm just joking. I, not, it's not been on all day, and then I got rid of it. What the heck? 
Oh. We're going to have to label this Dr. Mercola and his phone. That'll be the, the title of the, the podcast because we have multiple guests. I'm just joking. I don't care. It's all yeah. Good. No, it's just, I don't know why. It's just <laughs> they're popped up again. I don't know it's, why it's doing this. I have to. Good, we're, we're, we're casual here. Um, so is there anything else that pops out? So, so we're not getting enough sun and there's, did you say 400,000 deaths in, in relation to that? Yeah. 400,000 a year. A and so year. what is that, what does that actually look like as far as like, how is that? It's, more, it's pretty evenly split between cancer and heart disease. Okay. So, so sun. Yeah. They've actually, yeah in the book embrace embracing health, they actually spec it out on all these different diseases and they give you the annual, you know, the, average number of deaths per year okay and they've got the stats for it in the references so i'm not making this up who, who, to... who writes the embracing the sun book mark Sorensen. all right i'll grab that thing that sounds awesome um yeah there, and what about what about the value of um and well we can wrap up here pretty soon because you probably got 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 things to do but um what about the value of, of yeah exactly <laughs> um uh the value of darkness because we're all sun, you need sun, you need light, you need energy. Yeah, you need yeah, yeah, yeah. The contrast is so important. You, could opt to, you know, it's your circadian cycles. And I just interviewed Sachin Pond, who is, I really like that guy. He's out at, uh, I think he's at Salk Institute. Hmm. But he wrote the book, The Circadian Code, and he goes into that quite extensively. It also talks about circadian cycle with respect to timing of your food. And I didn't realize right. 90% of Americans, 90% of Americans eat outside of the 12 hour window. So they're eating for more than 12 hours a day. Nine out of 10 people, nine out of 10. Wow. Which is crazy. Yeah, yeah. so, and then he also says that 20% of the non-military population of the United States are shift workers, 20%, that's one in five. And what's a shift worker? Shift worker is anyone who stays up for three hours between 10 p.m. and 5 a.m., 50 days a year. Yeah. I don't think I do that one day a year. Yeah. As far as I can recall, I'm not guilty of doing that one. Maybe there's a year or two where I, you know, hit, hit one day or so. But, you know, so you got to, you got to be, and so you, the issue was darkness. So, you know, light is pervasive, which is a massive issue. I, I really, so we talked about sunglasses too. So you shouldn't wear sunglasses because you need exposure during the daytime. The bright light will cause your pituitary, anterior pituitary to make more melatonin. But then if you expose it, pituitary to light, especially blue light after sunset, then you've got problems. So when the sun goes down, the simplest thing to do, you can go to Amazon and get these blue blockers for like under $10. You know, they're, they're like birth control for the head because they're not very pretty or elegant, but they really work much better than the ones that have cost a hundred bucks. Hmm. Really very effective. And they'll and they got their wraparound lenses, or I think they're like laser glasses or something. But they have amber ones and they have red ones too, which are even more profound, but very difficult to see. Your visual acuity will decrease. So, um, but that you know, if you put those on for sunset, you're fine. You don't even need a screen blocker. But you know, if you don't want to wear your glasses, then use something like irisTech.co, i r i s dot t e c h, I believe dot co, and you can download that application and put the blue screen blocker, which is much better than Flux. And, uh, and you know, if you're going to watch TV, and I do watch TV at night, uh, I watch TV on a computer monitor that's hooked up to a computer. So unlike a regular TV, you can put a screen blocker on your computer. You can't put it on your TV. So I'm, you know, I basically watch red and white TV, which is pretty, right. pretty interesting way to watch it. I mean, it's not as, not as, you know, visually appealing, especially when you have like HDR TV and you, know, you can't see hardly anything on it, but. But it's still, you still can still get the gist of things. So it might be a, a nice like. Uh, but but that, and you preserve your melatonin, you can sleep better. Right. And then you can verify that and validate it through the aura ring. Cool. Awesome, man. I love it. Um, is there anything else that stands out as far as information in relation to sun that people people should have? Um. Yeah, I think those are the main ones. Uh, cool. wait. Uh, I should have reviewed these notes before. I thought my interview was tomorrow, so I didn't want to review that. <laughs> no, no worries. We can do it. But we can do it again. Is, okay, here, the, it's, it's called NMSC, non-melanoma skin cancer. That actually kills 1,500 people a year in the United States. Okay? Mm. Do the math. 1,500 people die possibly related to excessive sun exposure, but more likely it's excess sugar and bad 
trans fat and polyunsaturated uh, you know, vegetable oils and industrially processed that's more likely in deficiency in omega-3 and vitamin D that's responsible for those. But say, just attribute all those deaths, which is a lie, it's just not true, to, to sun exposure. Well, there's 400,000, 1,500 people dying from non-melanoma skin cancer, 400,000 people dying from lack of sun exposure from cancer and heart disease, and a variety of other diseases that are all listed in the book. Mm. So you do the odds. I mean, it's like crazy. It's hundreds of people. For every person that dies from skin, non-melanoma skin cancer, you got hundreds dying from the other diseases. Wow. It's, it's almost the same art rationale they're using for the greater good for the justification of vaccines. Yeah. You know, they, they are literally harming hundreds of people for every person that's potentially benefited from. Right. Well, thanks for doing this, man. I really appreciate you. I really appreciate all the work you do and sharing your time. And it's, it's awesome, man. I, I, what's the best way for people to learn more? What's like coming up? What's, what's the next in the tunnel for you? Um, well, I've got a really good book about uh, that combines ketosis and fasting. It's a revision of water fasting. It's called partial fasting. Okay. what we call keto fasting. And it's a really intriguing concept that can not do a number of things, facilitate detoxification, optimize it, optimize your weight and activate your stem cells and something called autophagy, which is rebuilding, actually you're getting rid of the junk in your cells and the stem cells help you repair and rebuild things. So it's a really a powerful rejuvenation process. And that book comes out in May called okay. Keto Fast. Great. And then people can obviously visit your, your website. Is hey, it, yeah, is it Mercola, Mercola, drmercola.com? Yeah. No, no, just Mercola. Mercola.com. Yeah. Awesome. Well, um, thank you so much, man. Thank you so much for tuning in that conversation. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, we got a couple things to help support that body of yours. One of which is the Align Band that people have been really loving, which I'm super grateful for. Um, it is a heavy duty resistance band, comes along with a door anchor, traveling case, and then a online video guide on how to use that thing. It's my absolute go-to travel tool. I've got it hanging literally from my door right beside me now. Um, use it regularly, use it with clients. Uh, it can be found at alignpodcast.com slash gear. Uh, on Amazon, and you can also find it at Line Band on Instagram. Um, also, we finally did it. We created the Align Method online program, which focuses on unwinding the patterns of staring into technology, essentially. So forward head posture, rolled forward shoulders, rolled forward spine, kind of like just that hunchy posture thing that um, modern world is is stricken by uh, gets into how to align your physical body so self-care joint by joint from ankle to knee to hip to spine to head to neck etc really good stuff also gets into lifestyle um, gets into morning routines nighttime routines how to effectively handstand how to move on the ground um, people have been loving that. Thank you all for grabbing it, the ones that have. And if people have any questions about that, you can reach out at Align Podcast on Instagram. I'm happy to support. All right. Thank you, guys. Enjoy your day. Thanks for joining you. Thanks for telling your friends. Thanks for reviews on iTunes. That's it. Pow.